All right, good afternoon, and thank you so much for being here at the IPI Research Seminar. So today it's my distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Arnie Milstein. He is a professor of medicine and the director of the Clinical Excellence Research Center at Stanford University. His research examines a span of topics, including positive value outlier assessment, human-centered healthcare design, and in partnership with Stanford's um, artificial intelligence lab, the development of technology-based cognitive aids to boost the yield from healthcare spending. Before joining Stanford's faculty, he founded a national healthcare performance improvement firm that he expanded globally after its acquisition by Mercer. He subsequently co-founded several nationally influential public benefit initiatives, including the Leap Frog Group and the Pacific Business Group on Health. As a Congressional Med PAC Commissioner, he originated two legislative changes to align healthcare provider revenue with value to patients and elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences, Dr. Milstein chaired the planning committee of its series on best methods to lower per capita healthcare spending and improve clinical outcomes. So we do have one small request for this afternoon because Dr. Milstein will be sharing some pre-publication data with us today. We kindly ask that you do not share that particular data through social media such as Twitter. And just thank you for your understanding of that. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Milstein to the IHPI Research Seminar Series. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so when I came to Stanford, uh, we began to develop a center that was focused on a, on a topic that for which there were no other rep representatives at Stanford. And it was specifically the notion of um, how could one uh, apply and advance uh, scientific knowledge on ways of delivering care that might begin to slow down the rate at which American healthcare spending was growing and out of it develop insights that might be uh, usable in other countries as well. So unlike most of, actually all of my other health services research uh, colleagues at Stanford, we were not primarily focused on improving clinical outcomes or patient experience. We were focused on, on explicitly uh, lowering healthcare spending with the, with the specific uh, constraint that at least at the margin, whatever we worked on must simultaneously improve clinical outcome and patient experience. But the, what we were trying to optimize was uh, the advance of, of scientific knowledge that would enable lower healthcare spending growth in, at a national level. So I thought I'd you know, begin the journey with, uh, with the policy problem that our research is, is designed to help solve, because that's how I, uh, that's inevitably how my mind works, is understand the, the national, in this case, national goal uh, that we're trying to solve, and then begin to work, uh, work the problem backward. So um, order of magnitude, um, by how much would we have to modify, uh, what are the opportunities for modifying American healthcare spending uh, and, that uh, at least seem to be within either the realm of, uh, of reasonable aspiration or, or prior uh, evidence reviews. So uh, here's, a, here's a summary. By the way, this is just, if you've never read this, this is really worth reading. This is uh, an article written in all publications. The last publication you might expect to see such an article written, it was written in Foreign Affairs uh, by Peter Orzag, uh, an, health econ an economist and former uh, head of, uh, of both the CBO, Congressional Budget Office, and OMB, the White House Office of, Office of Management and Budget. And, uh, and he, after you know, spending time working for Congress and, uh, and one of the administrations, concluded that almost every other American priority that uh, is aimed at improving uh, both u domestic and international well-being is primarily, is, is hugely dependent on whether or not we can safely slow healthcare spending growth uh, in this country. It seems on the face of it, uh, you know, an, an, an unreasonable uh, f uh, focus or, or notion of where the leverage is on, on human well-being globally, but I would invite you to uh, read his article and, uh, and see whether you, you agree with his, uh, his reasoning and logic. I do. Now, if you were to sort of review a lot of what uh, 
the National Academies uh, have written and has been published in Health Services Research, which is primarily what the National Academies feed from, one would reasonably conclude that uh, at a national policy level, one might conceptualize of three, uh, three objectives that if we could make movement on them in terms of advance of science or, demonstra or applied science, could, could really make a difference in solving this problem uh, that uh, Peter Arzag is pointing to. The first is, you know, can we, can we improve uh, quality faster than it is currently improving? Um, for, for many of you who are more into Washington policy than others, you'll know that uh, in about uh, seven or eight years ago, maybe nine years ago now, Congress asked AHRQ to annually pull together a composite of uh, reasonable measures that reflect quality of care in the United States. And, uh, and report annually to Congress on the rate at which uh, quality defined through a combination of process, structural, and outcome measures was, uh, was improving. And, uh, and if you, uh, if you the, if when I, last time I contacted the AHRQ uh, director and then she referred me to uh, his, uh, her medical director, generally the composite is historically even improving at about 1% a year. And so one aspiration from a policy perspective to, it would essentially say, is there a way that we might uh, invest our, our invest scientific investigatory resources and our, uh, our engineering uh, uh, applied science uh, tests of, uh, of those, uh, that knowledge to speed up the rate at which uh, our, our national index of, of quality, again, both outcomes and process rate, rate uh, based is growing. Uh, second, it would be to essentially reflect on quite a few, at this point, National Academy reports over the last 15 years that generally center on about a 30% one-time opportunity to lower per capita health care spending in the United States without jeopardizing uh, quality or, uh, or patient experience. The, and maybe if there's, some, and during our Q&A, we can sort of go into that, but that's sort of a reasonable estimate. There's certainly, uh, you know, uh, people who don't believe that's the case. Some people like Brent James, who's one of the country's most uh, ambitious you know, improvers of healthcare. He thinks the answer, the right answer is closer to 60%. Uh, there are others who think that that, uh, even if it was technically possible, it's politically infeasible. And they would, you know, rate the number lower than 30%, but that's a reasonable, you know, up center of, uh, of I'll call it uh, science-based estimates as to what the one-time opportunity is. And then, uh, and then what Peter Orzeg is primarily focused about is, is not so much healthcare spending, but the first derivative of healthcare spending, the rate at which it's growing. Uh, as many of you probably know, for the, ever since the United States made a huge investment in biomedical science, there's been, uh, a, uh, and also providing uh, health insurance, uh, uh, there has been, and, and also realizing the benefits of that investment, which is, in, among other things, a, an aging uh, society. Uh, healthcare spending growth in the United States on a per capita basis has outgrown GDP by about two and a half real percentage points a year. The last few years, it's been a little bit slower than that. But if you look cyclic, you know, over the longer term, it's about two and a half percentage points. So if you were a policymaker in Washington and and if some of you likely in this room will be in 20 years, um, you, would, you would find yourself wanting to know what this third number is and then wanting to close that gap. The reason to close that gap, of course, is what Peter Orzag is writing about, is when healthcare was only 4% of GDP, the opportunity cost for spending that money on K through 12 education or international uh, security or, or uh, basic research, whatever you would like to invest uh, that money in, was not so high. Now that it's 18%, uh, the displacement, uh, the, the, the opportunity cost associated with that, that spending is getting to be massive. And you know, there, are many, there are many people who run state and local governments who say that uh, there's so many ways they would like to spend uh, that money that they think actually would improve uh, human well-being more than, uh, than the marginal dollar invested in healthcare. But they, feel overwhelmed at, at which the rate at which their obligations uh, to spend money on health care is pulling money out of, out of other resources. And just, to, uh, just a factoid for you to think about is that it was about six years ago that for the first time, growth in state Medicaid spending 
uh, for, for the first time began exceeding how much states had available to spend on K through 12 education. Not a happy watershed moment uh, for those of you who believe that education can make an enormous difference in human well-being. So that's, those are the improvements. And then I, you know, my focus was at Stanford to so essentially say, what can we do uh, to uh, either apply or advance science in ways that would, would slow uh, healthcare spending growth, subject to the constraint that we don't want to do so. We always want to make sure that we're, we're, we're whatever, we, whatever we try to discover and test is not, uh, is not impairing uh, patient experience or, 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 val or patient valued clinical outcomes. So, you know, fortunately, you know, others have gotten this message and there's been a variety of, of policy initiatives that uh, unfolded during the time that I was active uh, in advising federal uh, Medicare policy as a MedPAC commissioner over the last uh, uh, 10 years. And this is a, a, brief, uh, a brief summary. I won't go into them. It's just sort of a, you know, the, the policymakers have been, have been active. I think today if you were to ask uh, people, you know, the average doctor, uh, trench level doctor or person running a community hospital is the is the case for va for improving value thus far a so-called stay in business issue uh, for your medical group or your hospital most of them would say not yet yeah, we, we we acknowledge we, we sense the directionality that, that this this sequence of uh, of primarily federal policy uh, under both uh, Bush and, and the Obama administration have occurred but at this point, we're still not uh, in a position where we're prepared to make fundamental changes in how we deliver care in order to lower the cost of, of excellent American health care. I think in, in some ways that's why I think, you know, the, you know, Stanford tolerated the focus <laughs> that I took my center, which is this essentially from the first place that Stanford focused un unapologetically on how we might lower uh, in a safe way uh, American health care spending. So what did we do? So the, what we realized is that there was a certain amount of, uh, of, of, uh, of research and, uh, and applied research we wanted to do. But we began in the bottom half of this diagram by uh, beginning to understand the nature of, uh, of the opportunity, of just current opportunities to apply knowledge to lower the cost of, of great health care. And so we, we began, if you look at this list down below, to focus on categories of American healthcare spending that, uh, that constituted a major share of GDP. And in some cases, you'll see items on this list that today aren't really conceptualized that way, like, you know, first 2,000 days of life, right? It's, that's, it's not a lot of American healthcare uh, spending currently in that category. But what, what a number of health economists, uh, economists and healthcare economists have taught us is that that those, uh, the, the, first, the first five years of life, uh, getting those right can be enormously faithful with respect to not just uh, uh, healthcare spending, but health-related spending. Uh, you know, impact of, uh, of, of, for example, inadequate vocabulary exposure, you know, during ages, especially zero through three, uh, can, uh, the current evidence suggests that can make an enormous difference in people's, uh, uh, in the costs they incur with respect to criminal justice, unemployment, uh, and a variety of other uh, facets of human uh, potential fulfillment. So we, with each of these, what we've done is we've brought in, uh, here's, here's Alex, who I see sitting here, and yeah, now one of your medical students, part of our, our, our research team. Uh, but essentially what we do is we bring in uh, mixed groups of fellows from engineering, medicine, uh, social science, and we say, here's, we're going to define a big chunk of American healthcare spending in a particular category. And we want you to use a variety of, of techniques to try to formulate by the end of the year a, uh, an approach to healthcare delivery that you think would most profoundly lower healthcare spending and health related spending in that category. And if your ideas are persuasive, we'll then reach out to places around the country, uh, including but by no means limited to Stanford, that might be interested in testing whether this aggregation of existing uh, insight and science. Uh, might uh, will indeed uh, lower the cost of health care by as much as uh, as current evidence suggests uh, this combination of, of of ingredients that you've that you've discovered over the course of a year uh, is hypothesized to uh, 
to to uh, to occur to uh, to affect. And um, and these are roughly, and as you see, uh, you know the 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 ones that we developed in 2012 are a little bit further along in their testing. But inevitably, you know, the, the what we know about innovation in any industry is is the early, you very rarely, you know, in coming up with a, an innovation in anything, including care delivery, get it exactly right uh, the first time. And so we invest only <coughs> modest resources in the initial evaluation. We just want to understand some very basic things like, can these ideas actually be implemented, these different ways of delivering care? And, uh, and if they can, what is the general direction of their impact on cost and quality? We're not trying to do refined health services research at that point. Then the notion is, based on that learning experience, to refine the model and then, uh, and then do a more methodologically rigorous uh, evaluation. In the course of doing that, there are certain areas in which even an advance of hiring faculty with, with, uh, with, with much better training and research methods than I'm able to offer. We have begun to uh, collaborate with Stanford faculty and faculty from other universities in pursuing relevant uh, lines of, of research. The one I'm going to talk about today is, uh, is what we call bright spots research. This essentially is uh, early attempts to use increasingly available American healthcare databases to home in not on healthcare organizations like uh, you know, large integrated delivery systems, but what Eugene Nelson has referred to as uh, patient-facing clinical microsystems, a team. Uh, teams of, of, of patients, uh, of teams of clinicians taking care of a particular uh, group of patients and seeing if we can surface a group of those uh, patient-facing clinical microsystems uh, that are associated with much lower annual per capita healthcare spending and a favorable composite score on available quality measures. Now, that sounds like, why haven't people done this in the past? Well, there's a lot of reasons, not the least of which is getting a hold of a database other than Medicare <laughs> has been extremely difficult. And historically, getting hold of the Medicare database and then mapping it down to the identity of individual you know, uh, clinician-led teams has been nightmarish. Um, and so it's been difficult to do. Um, and I was also, I was particularly interested in, in understanding what, what was the case for what called so-called commercially insured patients. That was always an area of, of great mystery. You can't just go to the Medicare data research database. And so, uh, and, and increasingly uh, these databases have begun to be put together by United Healthcare, by Truven, and by, uh, by, uh, uh, by the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association through its Blue Health Intelligence uh, database. And so I was able to persuade one of them to uh, allow us to, uh, in different categories of medicine, uh, rank uh, patient-facing clinical teams on uh, risk-adjusted total cost of care and a quality composite. And that then enabled us to do what we call bright spots research, which is more, broad, more properly termed positive deviance research, these high-value clinical teams try to understand what, what might be unique about them relative to average performing uh, clinical teams. So I'll, that's what I'm going to talk about for a few minutes, and that's what uh, was referred to as the pre-publication uh, uh, assessment. And I'm not going to go deep on the methods because I want to show you, I want to take this conversation actually in a different direction, but just give you a sense of this research that is really, it's, it's we started with a policy objective and then worked backwards, and then based on that, on, on, on knowledge questions we ran up against, we then uh, launched this kind of uh, research focused on as we sort of worked backward from trying to solve a national, uh, a national policy problem. So um, we, we, we anointed, actually the original name for this was uh, American Idol in Medicine, but the, uh, we got a call from the lawyers for the, from the TV program who didn't like that idea. <laughs> so we changed it to uh, America's Most Valuable Care. And it is basically uh, bright spots research. And this, was, this is not anything that I think NIH uh, would fund. And certainly PCORI is actually prohibited uh, from funding comparative cost effectiveness research. Um, it's funny. They talk about you know, a little insight into policy. So when I was a MedPAC commissioner, 
the original idea was that you know, we should spend $10 billion not just on comparative effectiveness, but comparative cost effectiveness research. And I was one of the most outspoken MedPAC commissioners favoring an equal investment in comparative cost effectiveness research. And then finally, the word came back from Capitol Hill that uh, uh, the healthcare industry was, would not be very supportive, uh, uh, including the whole healthcare supply chain, pharma device industry, not too interested in, in funding uh, comparative cost effectiveness research. I said, you know, that is what America probably needs more as much as, if not more than comparative effectiveness research. And then finally, um, in open, open, open MedPAC hearing, uh, the chair of MedPAC, as I began to refuse to give ground, <laughs> you know, said, um, you know, Arnie, it's, you know, if we insist on this, this will never be enacted. So how about showing a little flexibility? Because <laughs> generally, med Congress likes uh, unanimous MedPAC votes. So it's one of those areas where I, I, uh, I agreed, uh, uh, reluctantly though. So, so here's how we fo where we focused our, you know, our, our the different categories of, uh, of research. This research, there are reasons why this research wasn't done, not only related to availability, but also if you think about it, related to sample size. I mean, this is, if you think about, Take any given American database, you know, IMS, uh, th the, uh, the Blue Health Intelligence database, the Truven database, any of these. When you begin to try to take the microscope down to the level of individual clinical teams, your denominator sizes for calculating total cost of care and, uh, and quality begin to get into the range of what does it really mean anything. And I knew that we'd be going there. And so what I did is really in advance, I tried to pulled together some of the country's most sophisticated critics of prior research in this area and asked them not, not why this was hard to do, but if, if we wanted to get some initial insights, what would be the most liberal criteria uh, for, uh, for, for minimum cut points on sample size uh, for us to believe that we had more than pure noise? I said, we're willing to accept you know, not perfect signal, but how low can you take it? So I, I rounded up, you know, people who I knew uh, were critical about small denominator sizes, and also someone from, from your faculty who's done some of the most important research in this area, uh, Emeritus Professor uh, uh, J. William Thomas, Bill Thomas, and, uh, and, then, and then critics, you know, historical critics of this type of research like John Adams and, uh, and Ashish Jha, and basically said, help me plan this such that uh, we have a reasonable uh, signal to noise ratio, but we're not, we're not trying to uh, optimize for zero noise. We'll accept the fact that we may misidentify some of some places as bright spots, but I'd like us to set the criteria such that we believe that on the margin we'll be identifying bright spots, but I don't need perfection. I'm looking for direction. So I thought I'd show you, you know, kind of what, uh, what we found. I'm going to, uh, I think, I'll, I'll, this, this, I'll just, you know, briefly, this is what I've, I've said up until now. By the way, I, under, I under, underline mainstream because I basically said I am not interested in, in, uh, in, in, in replicating what my <laughs> colleagues at Dartmouth are doing in terms of focusing on what's different about these exemplary, you know, high value, giant healthcare delivery organizations like Kaiser or Geisinger. You can't go to a trench level doctor in the United States and say, be like Kaiser. It's just not, it's not a, that's not, not an answer. I believe what, they, what, what, what Dartmouth is doing is the right answer for big, well-run health systems, but, uh, but that's not today most of, uh, most of American healthcare. We were interested in mainstream healthcare systems. So in the remote chance that a place like Mayo showed up, and believe me, I didn't think they would show up because we remember we're looking at low total cost of care, which is not an area in which Mayo or Cleveland Clinic have particularly excelled, uh, but nonetheless, I would have excluded them from uh, from from the sample, and um, and then we uh, the uh, my health services research advisory panel uh, helped us to uh, compose a quality composite, be satisfied with you know one of the available tools for risk adjusting uh, total cost of care for a number of factors, and then we. Uh, the site visits are expensive, but we sent out the clinicians who were experienced either in measuring or managing uh, population-wide uh, performance and, uh, and matched them with people with, uh, with more general and administrative management uh, uh, skills. 
and we did uh, we did 16 visits. You know, 12 to uh, positive outliers, uh, uh, four to a group that we deliberately chose because they were near the center of the distribution, and the teams and and the clinicians were sent out blinded. They didn't know whether they were looking at. Uh, high-performing uh, sites or mediocre-performing sites. And we simply asked the team to interview everybody, our team, to interview everybody on the clinical team, including the receptionist, and just home in on the question, what, if anything, is happening here that uh, could conceivably explain low cost and high quality? And before you, 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 you fly home, download via phone a list of the things that you've found that you think might plausibly explain it. Then we'll aggregate your, your answers across sites and see if there are any themes that, uh, that recur uh, that are found either not at all or much less frequently in the, in the middle performing sites. That was essentially the, the essence of the, of the research design. And this is just a, this is really another way of saying what I just said. Um, and then uh, again, to try to make it simple, we started out with 15 scorable sites, but by the time we cleaned it up for you know, places that had two primary care doctors and eight OBs, or two primary care doctors and, you know, and mostly pediatricians, it, it narrowed down to about, uh, to about 8,000. And, and, uh, and there were fewer than 5% that scored in the top quartile on both measures. So it was slight, means the, you know, the two things are not uh, uncorrelated. You know, the, the, the if there is, it's a very slight, if you, would, if, if you think about it, top quartile would have been, we'd have expected about six, and a, if these two uh, facets of performance, low total cost of care and quality, would have been completely independent, we might have expected about a, you know, about a 6.25% uh, to qualify for both. We were slightly under 5%. Uh, under um, and these are, again, credit where credit's due. These are some of the, uh, some of the people who we look to uh, for advice on both uh, setting our quantitative and uh, qualitative uh, evaluation measures. Again, for qualitative, I turn to people who'd done, you know, like uh, uh, Ed Wagner and, and Tom Bodenheimer, uh, who've done uh, positive outlier uh, research in different domains of care. Uh, the team at Yale, Elizabeth Bradley, they've, they've done my feeling is we, we, you know, we're doing this for the first time. Let's talk to people who spent their careers doing it. So they helped us design uh, the method. And so I thought I'd just show you a, like a seven minute video clip of one of the places we found that in primary care, the primary care arm of the study, uh, excelled on a national uh, comparative scale on low total cost of care and, uh, and high scores on quality measures. This is a, you know, it's funny when you call these people, they first of all don't, when you explain, a lot of them have not even been thinking about low total cost of care. It's like they didn't know there was any such thing as a risk adjusted measure of, uh, of, of low total cost of care for an attributed primary care population. And, you know, give her, I'd like you to give her a break. You know, she's never, she's never been interviewed before. And also I apologize to you in advance that the foundation that funded this study hired a videographer who wanted to play spa music in the background, so. <laughs> okay. This is about a six month picture. My hypothesis was that there was a, a, a group of primary care doctors in the United States that excelled on two aspects of performance. Number one, they. My hypothesis was that there was a, a group of primary care doctors in the United States that excelled in two aspects of performance. Number one, they scored very, very favorably on quality of care measures. And secondly, they scored very, very favorably on low total health insurance spending per patient per year. We analyzed 15,000 primary care sites, and we identified fewer than 5% of these sites that ranked in the upper quartile on these two measures of performance. The doctors that our search uncovered were practicing medicine in three ways that fundamentally differed from their peers. First, 
they had a much deeper connection with their patients. My name is Dr. Naina Vias. My model of care is to have a close relationship with the patient, family, on an ongoing basis. Secondly, doctors whose sense of what it is to be a great doctor extended not just within the office visit, but to what happened to their patients as they dealt with other doctors. If I'm not communicating with my cardiologist, my pulmonologist, my cancer doctor, then everybody is ordering things and doing things that may be conflicting. And last but not least, these are doctors who did not try to do everything themselves. So I like to involve my team which is the case manager, the health coach, the social worker, and our specialist, and then extend it to the hospital if I have to put the patient in the hospital. Do you feel like if you're breathing in a straw, you, can, you, don't, you, don't, you feel tightness, you're trying to get that air from where you cannot have it, I call immediately here. Immediately. Uh, Mary has had asthma for the last 10 years. When I come here, they don't know me as a patient, so I don't have to go through the through the receptions. Before she was a patient of FPG, she used to be hospitalized or go to the ER frequently. She had almost like 10, 12 admissions a year. Each one of them were for 10, 12 days. And when I see the doctor, she's the best of the best because she knows my condition. She knows everything about me. Since she started coming to this clinic, which has access to the NAT treatments, IV antibiotics, she's been stabilized and she's been able to live her life to the fullest. I just had an asthma attack, what, a week ago? And who knows it? I was treated here. I didn't have to go to the hospital. And I'm fine. I was with my son at home. I'm at home, but I'm with him. It's not the same thing that I'm in the hospital and all that tension that you have. I'm free. <laughs> I'm free when I'm at home. My life without family, physician, I don't want to think about that. I will be in the hospital all the time. With doctors that they don't know my condition, they don't know my allergies, they don't know what I'm going through. I don't know what to be without them. So this was essentially just one of the sites. If we, the foundation is a condition of funding, you know, wanted us to put on their website and our website the names of these places in a brief profile. So if you want to go on our website or the Peterson Center on Healthcare website, you can get a little bit more information. But interestingly enough, Consumers Union, you know, came to uh, the, 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 the Peterson Center's presentation of their research findings, and they decided to pull together their own investigative team. And they went to a different site that we, that we had surfaced uh, in Minnesota. and, um, and Un, without consulting with me, consumers' reports uh, featured, you know, the, this uh, this particular site uh, in this month's issue of uh, consumers uh, consumers' report. And there's actually a web link, and you can see a similar video that Consumers Union made of a of a different one of these uh, positive outlier sites. This one was uh, uh, in one of the suburbs of Minneapolis, dealing with a very different uh, patient population. And you'll see in which these themes you know, played out in, in somewhat uh, different ways. One of the things that struck me about that site uh, that I really thought was interesting in terms of you know, health, health policy and doctors' understanding of how all this works is uh, I, didn't, I wasn't able to participate in all the debrief calls with our teams or with some of the pre-calls that we made to the sites before we went there, but I did in this case. And, and uh, as the team described what was happening at Northwest Family Physicians, and also help, and also through those interviews, helped me to understand that there was, unlike Florida, in, in Minneapolis, there was no, almost no value-based uh, payment at the time uh, that we studied this. I got on the phone with the leader of the medical group who was responsible for this, and I said, uh, you, know, you know, it's wonderful what you've done, but given the fact that there was nothing at all in terms of uh, 
value-based payment. You were just being paid ordinary, you know, primary care wages uh, fee schedule in, in, uh, in, in Minnesota. Why did you do this? Why did you take so much trouble to uh, lower the cost of good care? And uh, I don't think he'd, uh, he'd taken any courses in health policy or health economics, but he said, well, he said it was his understanding that if you could lower health care spending, particularly for working populations, it was good for job creation, you know, in, in your community. And that also, as, as he, you know, he said, I'm primarily dealing with working and lower middle class families, as they've been asked to pay a greater share of uh, health care spending, particularly at the point of service, he said, I just regard it as, you know, my job to, um, you know, to think about not just their, their health, but the impact of having less money available on their health. It was, a, a, for me, a very interesting uh, insight. So here's the summary of what we found underneath these, these three themes that I briefly referenced in the video, which I, you know, for sh shorthand referred to as heart, head, and, uh, and heft there were some particular features that we uncovered. They were generally, as our paper will show, were associated with about 15% higher score on the quality composite. Again, we used the Independent Health Services Research Advisory Panel to relatively weight the individual quality measures for clinical importance in primary care, um, and about 25% less risk-adjusted annual spending uh, using the ERG-based uh, uh, approach to uh, uh, to, to, uh, to, and and uh, some of these did not reach, the two of them did, did not re reach uh, statistical significance when we compared the high, pr the high value sites with the middle value sites, and I've indicated those with uh, uh, complaints or gold, that is the site's going to a lot of trouble in terms of establishing a trustworthy relationship with patients, that we found that not as frequently present in those that we, we sampled from the middle, but they were still, the, the difference was not significant. Same with uh, 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 select, this should be, it, with insourcing select, it should be selectively, error in the slides. We, some of these we found in, the, found in the positive outlier sites is primary care doctors were taking the, the less complicated 20% of some of the specialties they more frequently referred to, and they were doing it in-house. And uh, I know in the UK, that's, there, there's a, actually a formal program to do that, and some of those results clinically have not been associated with uh, better clinical performance, even though one can imagine why they might uh, lower healthcare spending. So uh, we, you know, after we got the results in, we wanted to make sure that we weren't simply identifying places that Medicare indicates are cheap to deliver care in because of low labor and, uh, and non-labor input costs. Fortunately, you know, we found sites that were in, uh, that operated in, in places where Medicare's way of, of, of figuring out, you know, how much doctors and hospitals have to pay for inputs uh, were both high and low. And we made sure we sampled from a diverse uh, group of geographies, uh, both because we wanted to make sure we weren't just representing a particular uh, region, and also we wanted to make sure that there was an equal representation of of, of practice, primary care practices that were operating in places that Medicare regarded as high cost in terms of the, the cost of labor and the cost of, uh, of, of inputs. Medicare has, has indices that, that it uses to adjust its fee schedule. Um, also, I, you know, one hypothesis going in is we would only find these uh, high performing practices in large integrated uh, delivery systems that could provide plenty of, uh, of backup and or in, uh, in, in, you know, in either uh, wholly capitated or, 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 or highly value compensated uh, primary care uh, uh, locations, but that was not the case. They really, they were, we found them all over the, all over the map, and some of them, we even found uh, an FQHC uh, in the southern, uh, in the, one of the southern suburbs of Boston that also ranked favorably. Again, this is for commercial patients, uh, between the ages of 18 and 65. I think if I had done some previous piece of research looking at Medicare and dual eligibles, and though the answers were somewhat overlapped, it's, those are different populations, and so the features associated with high value <laughs> sites were not exactly the same as, as, would be, as one would expect for a different population. Um, here, you know, in terms of what were the categories of, you know, when you kind of look at the, not just the place we visited, but all the places that ranked in the 
in the top quartile versus very close to the middle, or the 50th percentile, you can see that, uh, that the, the shrinkage was, uh, was, uh, was, was pr pretty substantial. And, uh, and, uh, and the, and the, 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 the uh, Natish Chowdhury at Harvard has been my methods partner in, uh, in evaluating this, and these, are, these differences were all uh, uh, in Natish's calculation uh, associated with uh, p-values of less than 0.01 in each of the categories. Um, you know, to sort of before, before we, you know, we move forward into your questions, as I've thought about this research and, and what might be possible in terms of, for those of you who have been doing research 10 years of now, from now as we begin to uh, develop increasingly granular sources of information as to what's actually happening to patients in their lives when they're not in front of us, uh, when, they're not, when we're not taking care of them. Um, I begin to think about this question of how big will databases need to be to discern some of the nuances of higher value care. And, um, and our lab has recently you know, developed a very deep partnership with the Artificial Intelligence Lab at the Engineering School what we've tried to do is say, you know, are there, are there facets of, uh, of, of data granularity uh, focused on uh, a patient, sometimes the, uh, in healthcare systems, but more often outside of healthcare systems, where there's really a lot at stake in terms of, you know, opportunity for, for, for intended care processes not occurring and patients getting into a lot of expensive health trouble very quickly, where we might deploy inexpensive forms of artificial intelligence to, uh, to begin to discern what's, you know, whether the intended critical care processes are actually happening. And as we reflected on the cheapest, most rapidly advancing forms of artificial <laughs> intelligence, the place where we've, uh, we've primarily focused is on uh, computer vision technology, so-called uh, machine vision. You can think of this as simply a way of, of using various types of cameras, be they what you know, conventional video cameras or infrared uh, cameras or laser-based cameras, to actually, uh, at a pixel level, understand human workflow, whether it's a patient taking care of him or herself at home or we've also been uh, looking in ICUs, where if an intended care process, such as a, a, a bundle, a so-called ICU bundle, doesn't happen, patients can get into trouble very rapidly. Uh, for those of you who are clinicians, think about the, the bundle of things that prevents either um, deep, venous th deep venous thromboses or uh, or, or decubitus pressure ulcers. This can, these are both, ex you know, once these things uh, happen, uh, it, 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 then it pulls the patient down a, a horrible uh, trajectory in terms of cost and human misery. And so we've been, we've been experimenting with cheap forms of, uh, of camera-based technology and ascertaining whether we can train a software layer uh, to discern whether critical intended clinical uh, processes are, are being missed before a patient uh, begins to uh, get into serious trouble. And you know how this can happen if for any of you who've worked in, for example, uh, an ICU. You know, it's everybody knows what the DVT uh, prevention bundle is, a uh, deep venous thrombosis prevention bundle is supposed to be. And one of them is that if a patient's unconscious, they should have these pneumatic stockings on their calves that are inflating about every minute and preventing uh, blood clots. But you know, what, what happens, you know, humans being imperfect as they are, is you know, somebody's giving the patient a sponge bath, uh, the, the stockings are off, they're paged to another bed for a perfectly valid reason. They mean to come back and put it back on, but then 12 hours later somebody notices they aren't on and the patient's uh, you know, a heart rate has begun to already rise and you know that uh, you're, you're in a very bad place and you're on a very bad uh, trajectory. So we've, we've been placing you know, inexpensive cameras uh, in ICUs and in the homes of cognitively impaired patients who desperately want to stay out of nursing homes and the state governors of almost every state in the United States want some out of nursing homes also because it would cost them an incremental roughly $90,000 a year if they had to be in a nursing home. And we've just been trying to see if we could train a software layer to economically and accurately uh, discern deviations from the things that, uh, from, the, from the, the human activity that we believe would be associated with safe 
uh, you know, trajectories, either infinitely, uh, indefinitely at home, or uh, or through uh, through an ICU stay. Just to I'll close by just showing you kind of how this looks. This is a uh, a video made by one of our shared postdocs between our lab and the AI lab, and this is a think of this as a few hours in the life of a cognitively impaired senior living alone at home and not wanting to go in a nursing home, and. Um, and this was made a few years ago, so our level of discernment in terms of clinical significance has gotten much better. We're able to discern much more important things than the things you'll see here. But to give you a sense of how this works, the red dots is what the software layer is, is, is being trained to interpret. It's movement. It's human movement in space that essentially is how machine vision works. You know, the, machine, the machine's been, think of the software as having been trained to discern what certain objects mean and what certain uh, spatial configuration is. And what the machine is then doing is as a particular objects, you know, typically life forms, you know, move, uh, move uh, through space, uh, the, the, the machine learning uh, can be used to essentially begin to determine with increasing levels of accuracy what's going on. So what we did is we asked a bunch of geriatricians what are the things that uh, would be critical to know uh, about a patient trying to make it who is cognitively impaired at home? And they gave us a list of 20 things, things that like, is their gait becoming more unsteady? Uh, some, some things that when they first said it, I didn't know why in the world it mattered. You know, for example, uh, seniors spending more time in the, uh, in the foyer of their studio apartment. I said, well, why, why, did, why does that matter? Well, it turns out that most cognitively impaired patients have been told not to go out alone uh, because you know they can't determine, can't distinguish between the walk and the don't walk signs, whatever the problem may be. But humans, being what they are, as they begin to uh, become more ambivalent about uh, staying inside and wa versus wanting to go outside, they spend more. Of the, anyway, you get the idea. So I'll just show you how this works, and I won't keep it going for long. But let's. Um, So you're going to see, essentially, the, the red dots are going to show you the movement the software layer is interpreting. And then along the top of the picture, you'll see what the software thinks is, uh, is happening. And then we'll, op we'll just open up for some discussion. So with clinicians, what the clinicians are telling us, what, what are some of the pattern changes, you know, day to day, hour to hour, that, that, or sometimes minute to minute, that they, they believe if they were notified about would enable them to make uh, them or one of their family members, uh, one of the patient's family members, to make an enormous difference in the patient's uh, clinical trajectory. Again, this is outdated. You know, we've, we've, we've now tuned the software to interpret much more clinically significant m movement than, uh, than what you see referred to here. Okay, these were the things that the clinicians said we should detect and that we're now working on. Um, let's stop there and, and uh, I invite your questions or comments. Thank you. And show them the differences you found and ask them sort of whether they were interested or what they perceived the barriers were? Yeah, so it's being done in, in a variety of forms. First, the Peterson Center without us has decided to select three sites around the country that they consider to be mainstream sites. And they're initially testing simply whether or not these 12 features that we identified, the degree to which average humans in a primary care practice can actually replicate these things. So it's just a question of can you, can you engage more frequently in these activities that, because the answer may, may be no for a number of them. Um, others have moved forward, you know, more aggressively uh, in the absence of much information on what you can do, particularly as MIPS, you know, the, the new, uh, the new uh, replacement for SGR that's headed the way of most practicing doctors in 2019. That's going to begin to uh, vary how much Medicare pays based on conservative resource use and quality. And so the American College of Physicians has loaded this information 
onto its, uh, the, the performance improvement website that 110,000 American doctors subscribe to and use to uh, improve their practice and, uh, and portray this as, as an early insight as to what's different about colleagues who are scoring better on the things that Medicare is about to pay differently based on. Thanks very much for an excellent presentation. Uh, what do you think about the role of price in American healthcare? There's been, when we think about sort of why we spend more than other countries, uh, there's been some prepared <laughs> work that suggests Americans don't get a much higher volume of care, but the services that we pay per unit care, whether it's a hospitalization or a procedure or a doctor's visit or a medication are much higher. And so, so how does work, it, it seems like a lot of what you're trying to do is you know, reduce costs by improved quality and improved efficiency, but if our prices are still much higher than the rest of the world, how, how far can we go in bending the cost curve? Yeah, it's a, it's a really important question because if you think about what are the three primary opportunities to lower the cost of population spending in any country, they real, I think, you know, in broad brush, they boil down to three things. First, eliminate useless or uh, or useful services that patients don't, wouldn't want if they really understood the pros and cons. That's category one. And I think there's some opportunity there, and that's what you know, shared decision making uh, is designed to do something about, as well as appropriateness guidelines, such as has been increasingly applied to imaging for back care. Um, but I don't think that's the, the primary area of opportunity. The second is what I think excites clinicians, which is this idea of hot spotting or intercepting finding just the right ambush point for in the, in, the, in the evolution of an illness and intercepting cost-effectively at those points with, uh, with evidence-based uh, interventions. Again, there's some opportunity there, but as, as John points out, uh, the, uh, the comparisons of other countries suggest that our problems are not related to volume of services. They are priced you know, per, per, per unit of service and, and, uh, and intensity. And then the third category is the category that unfortunately most American healthcare systems are least equipped to do something about. And that is what the economists would refer to as changing the production function, changing the mix of, of labor and technology used to produce a useful uh, a unit of service at just the right uh, ambush point uh, in the evolution of, uh, or the most cost effective ambush point. We don't know much about that and that's why the National Academies and recently the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology have said that probably the single most important leverage point in terms of getting new knowledge into the American healthcare delivery system is in the, uh, in the integration in practical ways of, of systems uh, engineering uh, uh, skills and capabilities. For those of you who want that decoded, what I've learned is it boils down to three things. Number one is systems analysis, really understanding all of the variable, all the important variables that affect whatever you're trying to change. Uh, the second is systems design. Think of this as not completely, but heavily in the direction of human factors. How do you, how do you make, you know, how, how do you begin to appreciate the fact that humans are, are accustomed, they like to feel a sense of mastery in how they do things. And as you come to them and say, hey, I've got a brilliant idea that's gonna make Peter Orzag happy, but you're gonna feel very incompetent for the first year and a half you're doing it, it's not generally a welcome you know, message. And so thinking about the psychology of, uh, of how you get anybody who's used to doing things a certain way and then change is, is, uh, is the second area of opportunity. And then this, this third is uh, you know, the so-called you know, ergonomic, uh, these, this ergonomics. You know, how do you make it easier for people to, to do things the most cost-effective way? It's in that, in that third category of the opportunities, yeah. Uh, back to the point that you were discussing about primary care in that study um, that highlighted the, the physician practice in Florida. So it, from the discussion there and the interview with the patient, it was very clear that there was a high level of connection between physician and patient, uh, presumably an ability to spend more time with that patient, really get to know them. And from what I know from a lot of practicing physicians, that I, I, be interested in how you reconcile that with the way things are going today when physicians, especially primary care, have larger patient census, oftentimes they're sitting behind a computer or tablet and they've got fewer minutes to spend with, with each patient because that 
successful example of the woman whose asthma was managed so successfully seems to sort of fly contrary to what I hear from a lot of primary care physicians today. Yeah, I don't, I don't think if, if this list had only included the first two categories, that is build a deep, relation, a deep trustworthy relationship with the patients and, um, and manage you know, all their interactions with other doctors as they traverse the healthcare system, I would have said, here's another impossible prescription to implement. You know, just like this idea of, you know, it's, I think it was Tom Bodenheimer who did the, the analysis, maybe, maybe it was somebody else, that, uh, that basically said if you ever counted how much you know, physician time, primary care di doctor's time would have to be spent just by meeting the preventive services guidelines, it would, it would ex exceed you know, our primary care workforce. And then so here's another list of things that could make a difference. And I just don't think it's, it's realistic. I think what we uncovered in these practices, which was the third dimension of our discovery, was a heavy leveraging of a team. Now you, the, what you saw a video of was an example of a larger primary care practice, was 10 or 12 primary care doctors. When we went out, if you, you go to the Northwest Family Physician Group that we, you know, Consumers Report uh, you know, profiled where we found this happening as well, there was three or four doctors and they don't have big complicated teams. They're leveraging medical assistants and really smart receptionists. Larry Casalino has written about this, about how he successfully he used somebody, you know, kind of a, an experienced mom you know, with great social intelligence and, uh, to, uh, to, to leverage him as a primary care doctor far far before the, you know, the PCMH movement uh, originated. But I think that's the, that's, you, I think it cannot be done in a traditional you know, staffing model. I think there, at a minimum, you'd probably need at least you know, two MAs uh, per doctor. And when, when we went to these sites and said, well, how, you know, how are they doing this? How do you afford to do this on primary care wages? We were impressed by two things. Number one is they weren't investing in a lot of machinery and stuff they had to pay off with, uh, you know, with high volume uh, services. And secondly, the office footprints in the places where these offices existed was modest. These were, these doctors didn't have their own examining rooms. They were in a bullpen, you know, around a table with, with their medical assistants. And so one of the doctors told me, that's how I'm able to use a medical assistant. I can hear what he or she is saying on the phone uh, to my patients. And if it's not right, I have a, I can very easily, you know, explain what was wrong about the prior, you know, guidance to the patient. And also it makes the, you know, the doctor much more accessible uh, to the low paid medical assistants who are helping, helping leverage the doctor's time. Great. Thanks very much for coming and for your questions.